February 14, 1929, started as a peaceful winter day in Chicago. Valentine's Day. It should have been devoted to love and warmth. Instead, it was a day of cold-blooded murder. The worst hit in Chicago mob history. Four gunmen, possibly working for Al Capone, kill seven followers of Bugs Moran. The worst mob hit in Chicago history. Still unsolved. has driven investigators for decades. Now, it's driving the son of a mobster. Our house was like, you know, it was like, you know, leave it to Beaver with guns. Meet Johnny Frato, Beverly Hills businessman, son of Lou Frato, mob boss who worked for Al Capone. At the time of the massacre, Capone's gunman talked business at Chicago's Green Mill Lounge. Now, Johnny, his brother Tommy, and business partner Wally talk family business. You go to a foreign country, you say Chicago, they say, oh, gangsters, Al Capone. Al Capone. It was like father knows best, or more like godfather knows best. Kids, uh, kids in school would say, what's your dad do, fireman, policeman? They come to us, it was uh, self-employed. What does that mean? He's self-employed, he works for himself. In 1967, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre movie came to theaters. Lou Frontal took the kids. My dad is talking through the whole movie. It was kind of embarrassing because, you know, there was, it was full. And he's kind of laughing and making fun of it and said, this is ridiculous. How could people be so stupid? He, he really went out of his way to say none of these people are being portrayed properly. And, and the thing was, I think that he, he more or less was trying to point out who, who wears the white hat here? Who, who, who's the bad guy? Who were the bad guys? That was the question in Johnny Frotto's mind as he watched the Valentine's Day Massacre movie. The Massacre mystery is built around four key questions. After the massacre, Chicago still remembers. Johnny Fronto's family talked about the crime his entire life, but he always wondered if what he heard was true. 
It's time for the son of a gunman to conduct his own investigation. It begins where it all began. We are right across the street from where the St. Valentine's Day Massacre took place on February the 14th, 1929. The garage where the seven men were killed was 2122 North Clark Street. Now it's this empty space, this little park next to a senior citizen's home. But, you know, at that point in time, it was a working garage. The wall where the guys were shot against would have been pretty much right about here. The north wall, long, of course, going east to west here, but in terms of the width, south to north, maybe about 25 feet wide. So the north wall would have been probably right around here someplace. The Clark Street Garage was a regular hangout for the gangs of George Bugs Moran, the second most powerful mob boss in Chicago. The first, the man they called Scarface, Al Capone. George Moran uh, and his lieutenants tried to kill Capone, and they tried to kill Capone's boss before that. And uh, this was a many exchanges over time that pitted these two men against each other, two very powerful men. Moran versus Capone meant the Irish versus the Italians, turf wars to control liquor and unions. To outsiders, Capone was a gangster. To the Frados, he was family. Like the nuns and the, uh, and, the, and the priests loved the Kennedys, the Italian people loved Al Capone. Why? Because he fed them. He took care of them. He gave them jobs. Our grandmother loved Al Capone. You couldn't say a bad word about this guy. She'd throw you down the steps. When the Untouchables were on TV, she would throw things at the TV. He, he was the gangster that America loved. He was the one that he really was a Robin Hood. Money that Capone stole from the rich to give to the poor came from prohibition. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was all about controlling that money. Capone made millions selling illegal booze. He didn't want to give any of it to Bugs Moran. Gangsters enjoyed the lifestyle. You know, this is prohibition. Um, you're making a lot of money. You're very, very successful. They're hanging around at night. They're drinking, they're carousing. Most of these guys had mistresses. And I'm going to be honest with you. My own personal experiences of just being the son of a gangster afforded me a lot of, you know, fun. Gangs that operate vice in Chicago have brothels and gambling uh, operations going on here. Yeah. And you have this tremendous amount of money that's suddenly on the table where it wasn't there right. before. So ultimately what we're talking about is conflict over turf, which is equated directly to uh, illegal liquor distribution. So we're all looking for distribution, bigger distribution. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. This, yeah. is, this is competition, and it is intimidation. And when intimidation doesn't work, it turns to violence. Keep your eyes on the prize. On Valentine's Day morning, eyewitnesses outside the Clark Street garage saw what they believed was a police detective's car pull up. Two of the four who got out were dressed as cops. A police raid? That's what the killers wanted the Morans to think. So once these guys posing as policemen, you know, meaning the gunmen posing right. as policemen, get inside the place, well, now you got to continue with the ruse for a couple of different reasons. The ruse being it's a police raid. The big one is, look, these guys are, you know, the hoods are dripping with guns. They're armed to the teeth. You got to get these guns off them first. Right. So police raid, you put everybody up against the wall. The two guys who are in the patrolman's uniforms with the stars and everything, they then frisk them down, take the guns off of them, etc. That's the um, sort of the brilliance of the plan. Right. We'll lure them into or lull them into submission, shall we say, right. by having them think these are real police officers. So they got them lined up against the wall at that point, and then the shooting starts. The massacre took only moments. 
When police arrived, Sergeant Tom Loftus was first on the scene. And what he sees is absolutely pure carnage. You know, there's guys that have, in some cases, been hit, um, you know, more than a dozen times. Uh, and they are right. Yeah, in my estimation from the uh, crime scene, you know, roughly the seven bodies are right around here someplace, more towards the back of the garage, towards the alley, as opposed to towards the front. Loftus recognized the victims as members of the Moran gang. Victim Frank Gosenberg was barely clinging to life. Loftus knows Gusenberg. He's seen him before. He says to him, what happened here? And first words out of Gusenberg's mouth, cops did it. Well, he lives for a few more hours, but once he gets to the hospital, he clams up. He won't say any more. He, he went back to his gangland uh, code, and that is you never identify the killers. And the last time they asked him, he said, nobody shot me. He had 14 holes in his body, but he said, nobody shot me. When photos of the scene hit front pages, they shocked the nation. It was one thing to hear about gangland killings, a lot different to see it. Tony Berardi, who was one of the photographers in the garage, Tony told me that I've you know, been on all kinds of uh, scenes, shooting pictures, plane crashes, you name it. Nothing ever shocked me like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It was, yeah. it was really sort of extraordinary imagery, and um, it's, it definitely not only uh, solidified Chicago's reputation as a place where this sort of violence occurred, but I think it also, on the other hand, uh, solidified people's commitment and conviction that this had to stop. In Washington, President Herbert Hoover declared it was time to stop mob violence. That seemed to translate into get Al Capone. Scarface behind bars could send a strong message. So where was Chicago's mob kingpin on Valentine's Day morning? Capone was in Miami at the time, which doesn't mean he couldn't have ordered it, but he was in Miami. In fact, he was meeting with the state's attorney for Dade County and with a prosecutor with a DA from Brooklyn. You know, he had a pretty good alibi, all things considered. Alibi or no, those who knew Capone, like Johnny Fratto's father, said the whole massacre was too much a crime of passion to have been ordered by their boss. Uh, if, you, if you look at organized crime, the majority of, 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 the, of the murder in organized crime is, are headshots. Always a headshot. Two shots a headshot, head shot, you know what you're going to get. You know that you're going to get a result. So the idea that they've got the most powerful guns on the planet at that time, and they're, and they're, and they're shooting down bodies, yeah, you know, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense made even less sense, Capone allegedly hitting the seven, but missing Bugs Moran. Here's a guy like Al Capone who could control politics. He could control the city, a city, a giant city. You're going to tell me he's going to make a mistake like that? He's going to let someone make a mistake like that? With the only massacre survivor dead, police scrambled for clues and eyewitnesses. They too saw cops. They saw three or four men leave going in this direction, east, towards Clark Street, come out the front door. There's a car there. They saw the, um, the two officers dressed in regular police uniforms, holding guns on one or two men, probably with their hands up, and putting them in the car as if they were making an arrest and taking the suspects away. Other witnesses got a glimpse of the car's driver. They remembered him because of what he was missing, a tooth and a finger. Across the street, police found a woman who rented apartments on her second floor. One of the things she said to him was, well, I rented uh, you know, these two apartments to these two guys. And then the one guy who had the apartment in the back said he didn't want that anymore, but he would just you know, pay me a little more and we, he'll join the guy in the front and that these guys were around and they liked to sit up in the front and look out the windows. In the apartment overlooking the Clark Street garage, police found a letter and the prescription bottle 
that would not appear significant until years later. The most important massacre evidence would be found at the crime scene. Shells and casings from Tommy guns and shotguns. But many, including Johnny Farto's father and family, knew that evidence would have little impact on a crime police may have not wanted to solve, unless it involved Al Capone. I don't think there was a concerted effort made to solve this crime in any way, shape, or form. You know, they wanted it to go away. Everybody believed Al Capone did it. It was the easiest thing to believe, and that's what everybody chose to believe. Three things made the St. Valentine's Day Massacre the stuff of legend, the brutality, the possible involvement of Al Capone, and the guns. The massacre made the Tommy gun an iconic American weapon. Kids playing cowboys and Indians wanted to play gangster instead. Mob kids got to play with the real thing. My uncle had a bar in his basement, and he had two of them. He had two Thompson submachine guns down in his basement. We'd just get them out and play with them. He didn't have a problem with it. You know, they weren't loaded. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they were, I don't know. For me, I loved holding those guns. I, I loved touching those guns. You know, and as I got older, I wondered if those guns had killed anybody and things like that, you know. Atomic guns brought mobsters the power to kill like no other weapon. At the massacre crime scene, police found shell casings for 70 rounds. They're shooting at them, you know, probably from within about a yard or so. So they could take that machine gun and go to the single shot after they'd done a spray, boom, 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 just to make sure. If you hold down the trigger, right. it's on automatic. Right. You can just, you know, Right. Pull release. Right. You could even, you know, fire short burst, pull little re right. release. But you know, you hold down the trigger, it's on automatic. I got you. As Chicago police began their investigation, many wondered if they could handle a case in which cops might have done it. First of all, if, if the police were involved, obviously, they would want to cover that up, and um, that would mean killing the investigation. And then you s have the simple fact, the indisputable fact that the Chicago Police Department was corrupt, that, that many of these guys were in the pocket of Al Capone and were in the pocket of, every, of other gangsters as well. Major Calvin Goddard was probably the foremost ballistic specialist in the country. I think he had been out in New York. Uh, the good citizens of Chicago then raised the money and said, you know, we got, it. we got this problem here, so what we should do is actually bring the top ballistics guy in, set him up with a lab here in the Chicago area, and this will be one of the first things he works on. Calvin Goddard was the first to prove that the barrel of every weapon leaves unique markings, fingerprints on bullets when they're fired. When Tommy guns became the focus of the investigation, he examined every one he could find. He tested all the police department's machine guns to see if any of those were used and found that they were not, um, which for a while the police were, were bragging, saying this proves the police didn't commit the crime. Of course, it doesn't prove that police were uninvolved. It just proves that they weren't stupid enough to use department-issued machine guns. Pressure was on Chicago police to make an arrest for the massacre. So they made one. Machine gun Jack McGurn was Capone's number one gunman. If you want to give Jack McGurn motive, he sure got it. What I question, though, is the, um, you know, him being involved. This is planned out like a military operation, the way the Green Berets or Special Forces right. would plan something out well in advance. And the best way to queer the deal is to send in guys that are recognizable to the North Siders. They've got lookouts in the garage, front and back. These are paranoid, non-trusting individuals. Right. They're just not going to let people walk in there. I agree. And the lookout's going to look out there and, you know, just pictures. Hey, look, guys, here's Jack McGurn in a police uniform coming up the garage. Yeah. It's all over. McGurn also had an alibi on Valentine's Day morning, a blonde alibi. Louise Rolfe said he was in the hotel with her. She said they were there all morning, that they were having a nice breakfast in bed, and she was willing to testify that, that he never left the room. Um, no question they would have made the case if they could have, but they didn't have any evidence. McGurn was released. Within weeks of the massacre, other Capone gunmen were found murdered. A lot of people thought Baran was responsible. 
revenge for the deaths of his men. But investigations would prove there was no Moran involvement. With no real leads and no arrests that would stick, police found themselves spending as much time defending their investigation as conducting it. Why couldn't they have gotten some of these gangsters to talk? You gotta believe that there were people in town who knew who did this thing. You know, these gangsters um, operated in a fairly small universe. Um, these machine gunners um, knew each other. It's hard to believe they couldn't get somebody to flip on this thing. Um, but it may be that they didn't want to. They didn't want to know the truth. Moving down the list of Capone gunmen, police came to Fred Killer Burke. They found some intriguing police work in his background. Police are looking into this stuff, including the state's attorney. And one thing that was telling was the use of the um, police uniforms as a ruse by the gunman. Uh, apparently, Fred Burke's gang and one of their bank robberies or something previously had done exactly the same thing. So that fit, and that got the got the, um, right. the authorities started investigating Burke. After months of searching for Burke, police came up with nothing. But in December, Burke found them in St. Joe, Michigan. After a routine traffic accident, he overreacted as only a mob gunman could. We've got Officer Charles Skelly standing on the running board, and he's looking in, peering in at Fred Burke at the wheel. He sees Fred Burke grab a 45 out of the pocket of his car, rolls the window down, and shoots the officer three times. The officer died. Burke fled the scene, and police searched his house. Today, it's a real estate office. Then, it proved to be an arsenal, packed with ammunition and weapons, including two Tommy guns. They were immediately sent to ballistics expert Calvin Goddard. They test fire him. Goddard uh, goes to his comparison microscope, does his comparison, and proves at that time, ballistically, forensically, that this gun fired 50 rounds that day and this gun fired 20 rounds. These are the two machine guns that were used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, February 14th, wow. 1929. Since the day they were found, the guns have been in the possession of the Berrien County Sheriff's Department. Goddard's ballistics tests prove not only that bullets found at the crime scene were fired from the weapons, but the rate of fire was so fast, it would have been impossible for any of the victims to turn react to the gunfire, and try to protect themselves. Wow, what a feeling. Keep it down. Hey, did I hit that thing? Yes, you did. Dead center. Dead center? Dead center. I'm a bad... could fire more than 800 rounds per minute. What a feeling. The 70 rounds fired in the massacre hit their targets in only five seconds. Finding the weapons used in the massacre was a huge break for police that went nowhere, even after Burke was found and arrested. Burke is never questioned in the Valentine's Day Massacre. He's, he's sent away for killing this police officer. But he's never brought to Chicago. He's never even questioned. He's never even asked, you know, where'd you get the guns? Who had them before you? Why don't the police seem interested in solving this crime? And if Burke was the killer, were they protecting Burke or were they protecting themselves? Was this a crime that the Chicago police couldn't bear to solve? I don't think there was a concerted effort made to solve this crime in any way, shape, or form. I think that, that they just put it out there, a lot of misinformation and, uh, and uh, disinformation, and that's it. You know, they just completely ignored it. One year after the St. Valentine's Day massacre, the police investigation was at a standstill. Many began to wonder if the killers dressed as police might not have been real cops. Cops that are going to show up at a thing like that are going to be the very identical cops that work in that neighborhood, that work that precinct. You're going to know them. You're not going to, you're not going to see a strange face. 
You're going to see the face that you see every single day that's the cop that is in your neighborhood. People back then are used to running from the police, okay? And there's too many of them, so it's easy to run. It's easy to hide. But regardless, you're definitely going to turn your head around unless you trust that killer. In November 1931, the Chicago coroner officially closed the investigation. He said the seven victims died at the hands of a person or persons unknown. Coincidentally or not, the person police would like to have linked to the massacre, Al Capone, had been convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to prison. Suddenly, the guy that they'd been trying to suggest all along was responsible uh, was put away. There was, there was no point in, in, uh, in, in carrying on the charade anymore that they were going to pin this thing on Capone. You don't close an investigation like this probably forever when you have one of the crime of the century. Nobody knew Al Capone didn't have the juice to get out of that tax beef. Nobody knew that, but somebody must have because nobody worried about it after he went to jail. The investigation may have ended, but new evidence continued to emerge. Police had little reason to link Capone gunman Gus Winkler to the crime until he himself became a target. Winkler's death prompted his wife, Georgette, to write a memoir linking him to the massacre as a killer working for Capone. She sent it to the FBI. One month before the crime, she was startled to see her husband with Capone gunman George Getz. I looked up from my chair in the sitting room and out of the corner of my eye caught a glimpse of a uniformed man standing against the wall. I screamed in fright, certain the house had been raided. But a burst of laughter caused me to look a second time, and I saw George Getz, garbed in a perfectly fitting police uniform. Getz enjoyed his costume and strutted about the house, imitating a policeman, making a raid. For the first time, Georgette Winkler provided a clue to the identity of the killer cops. On Valentine's Day, she learned more. The sheets were devoted to the massacre that morning. When I got to the house, I threw the papers in Gus's face and went into my own room. I was too sick with a horror to shed tears. In time, I got the complete story. The boys came in an automobile, garbage as policemen, entered the garage, lined the gang against the wall, and shot them down. Georgette Winkler called the group of killers the American Boys for their non-Italian heritage. She said Fred Killer Burke had provided the guns. The story made sense. The group was not from Chicago. They could have dressed as cops and not been identified. But Winkler's scenario drew little attention, too neat and tidy to be true. The, uh, the Winkler story is, is a hard one to figure out. I mean, Winkler was never really uh, mentioned much in, immediately in the aftermath of the Valentine's Day Massacre. He only becomes a, a, a person of importance after his wife writes this, this story. And his wife, you know, she's trying to sell a book. All right, listen to what I'm saying to you. First of all, they're not gonna trust, no one's going to trust cops that they don't know, A. B, do you actually think that they have to go to Detroit to get hitters when they can get zips out of Italy all day long? Bottom line on that is probably, what was the advance she got for the book? That's all it's about. She got a little bit of money to say, hey, you know, there's nobody here that, that, that's alive that can dispute me. Right, baloney. It's about the money she made selling the book. One month after Georgette Winkler sent her memoir to the FBI, another character would confirm much of her story. When Chicago police followed up leads after the massacre, they found evidence of a possible lookout position across from the Clark Street garage. A prescription bottle was found with the name Byron Bolton, another known associate of Al Capone. Investigators couldn't find them, but in January 1935, Bolton found them. He was in a St. Louis jail for kidnapping, and he made a stunning confession. 
According to Bolton, the massacre plan was hatched at a meeting in Wisconsin, headed by Capone himself. The idea was to use the American boys to do the killing. The target of the hit was gang leader Bugs Moran to eliminate the competition from the bootlegging business. The American boys were guys who the Capone gang used, um, so it's, it's certainly possible that um, if you were looking to, for some guys to do this job in the, in the garage, that you'd, you'd turn to some of these American boys. On the morning of the massacre, Bolton said he was on lookout duty. He was told to call the killers when George Bugs Moran and his men arrived at the garage. When he saw the group, he made the call. There was only one problem. He mistook one of the men for Moran. Send everybody now. See, it was not only cold, but it was snowy that morning. So you're walking down Chicago, the wind's yes. howling off lake. You got your hat pulled down, you got your collar pulled up. Uh, it's not an easy thing to go, oh, of course, that's, that's George Moran. Right. So somebody just jumped the gun. Somebody messed up. Apparently, Capone was absolutely livid with, I, I think, with Bolton. Well, you could imagine after something like this. The Bolton confession made for great reading in the papers. The story fit well with police evidence. But like the memoirs of George Ed Winkler, it was too little, too late. With Capone and many of his associates already behind bars, there was little interest in reopening the case. But the passion for massacre theories would not die. During the same time Bolton confessed, one final new scenario would emerge. This time, it involved real cops as killers with a motivation for revenge. In January 1935, yet another massacre theory would emerge. It came from an Illinois bureaucrat named Frank Farrell in a letter to the FBI. For the first time, he laid out a massacre scenario in which the killer cops were real Chicago police, motivated by a crime that occurred in the same neighborhood as the massacre. But right here is where it happens, This right? is it, we're on the ground. But what a lot of people don't know is Clark Street has another, there's another part of Clark Street that we don't know about. Yeah, a little further south, there's a restaurant called the CNO. Okay. It's a tough gangster hangout. Yeah. Guys would, uh, you know, in the back room, play some cards, drink. And, you know, if you ran into somebody you had a problem with, there'd be some shooting. And there was some shooting there from time to time. According to Farrell, two months before the massacre, William Billy Davern got into a fight in the CNO restaurant with members of the Moran gang. Davern was a firefighter and the son of a Chicago police officer. The fight ended with a gunshot. Davern, the son of a cop, suffered a critical wound. They dumped his body on the side of the road at the corner of Austin and Rush. Just leave him there, thinking he's dead, but he's not dead yet. He's, he's able to get himself to a call box. You know, one of these call boxes you pull, fire department comes, they rescue the guy, they take him to the hospital. For several days, Davern clung to life. Just before he died, his cousin, Capone gunman three-fingered Jack White came to visit. Davern told White he'd been shot by members of the Moran gang. According to Farrell, the St. Valentine's Day massacre was arranged by White. So, what you're saying is this was a retaliation hit for the hit that was done on this cop's son. A lot of it adds up. I mean, usually if you're gonna see somebody killed like this, you're gonna see seven men dead in the garage, there's gonna be somebody who's angry. There's gonna be a motive that's, that's crystal clear. You're gonna have somebody looking for revenge. Right. And this explains that pretty well, this fits. And uh, you kill a cop's son, pretty much you gotta expect something. That's right, it also helps explain why these guys are dressed as cops. Right. You got a cop's son killed, the cop can get you guys the uniforms, he can get the police cars they need to pull this job off. And it also this helps. This is interesting, so you're saying this is real police uniforms, real cars. Absolutely. For the first time, one scenario seems to have solved all the massacre mysteries. For the Frontos, the theory of the massacre being a revenge killing just makes sense. With any crime, it's usually the simplest explanation is the one that turns out to be true. If you gotta bend yourself into knots to come up with an explanation that makes sense, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. Right. 
Well, the straight line is the fastest way to get to the, to the destination. That's right. But like every possible scenario, this one also has a potential flaw. It has been hotly debated. But on the morning of February 14th, 1929, three-fingered Jack White may have been in jail for murder. White uh, almost certainly was in jail at the time of the Valentine's Day Massacre, but according to Farrell's letter and according to everything we know about Cook County Jail, that wasn't much of a problem. People were able to come and go from the jail because the, the, the guards were bribed. Not everyone agrees that it was so easy for White to get out of jail. Despite some counterclaims, there was no open door policy at Cook County Jail. Okay. Uh, there had been some corruption and problems at Cook County Jail in 1925, which forced the local authorities to do the thing you rarely do in Chicago, to not put in a political lackey as the head of the jail, right. to go outside and get a respected, what they call, penologist from Indiana, a prison official. He came in totally cracked down, and all the abuses at the jail are gone. The Tribune is emphatically clear about this. So there was no way that Jack White, as a convicted cop killer, is going to let anybody let him out of Cook County Jail. For the Frothos, the scenario involving three-fingered Jack White is too good not to be true. It's no longer a crime of business, but a crime of passion. When you put the element of the policeman's son in there, everything goes out the window. Now, if it's just about business, yes, it is too much of a crime of passion. You, you have the killing of, a, of an officer's son, and did it. And let us let us explain another, another <coughs> thing about about Italians in general. Children, the most important thing we have, our children. Your child, you know, his child, that's the most important thing. Right. So when that happens, it, it negates everything. All reason. All reason. after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Johnny Fratto and his family understand why we're so fascinated by it. Why do we talk about Manson? Why do we talk about all the things that happened in the past? Why do we still talk about Marilyn Monroe? Why do we still talk about Elvis Presley dying in the stool? Why do we do that? Because we like the bad things. We like to hear the gore and, the, and how gruesome. Because we, as people, are so alienated by that, that this is intriguing to us. But the Fathers have a problem with the image of gangsters always settling their arguments with guns. Well, I mean, the stereotype, you know, like the real gangsters that we met were gentlemen. The real gangsters that we met weren't barbarian acting guys. I think that anybody can get barbarian if they're put in the situation. But most of the people that we met were classy, cool guys. Um, I think blood was a big expense. I know to my dad it was. I, he didn't believe in any kind of violence. He would say, just buy everybody. Many believe Al Capone did just that in planning the Valentine's Day Massacre. He made friends with his money, like the American boys, who took care of business without his being directly involved. I think that uh, it's a very fairly safe bet that uh, this operation was uh, ordered, uh, if not planned, by Al Capone. I still don't know if we know all of the individuals who yeah. pulled the triggers, but I think that um, the idea that uh, anybody other than Al Capone could have uh, perpetrated this crime, it's, it's sort of hard for me to believe. Capone is finally tired of these guys on the north side. Instead of just trying to take out the guy at the top, maybe just Moran, he's going to try and take out the whole upper layer, get them all at once. The American boys theory is the most popular because it explains why the killer cops weren't recognized. They came from out of town. But the theory of the killer cops being real police seeking revenge has some strong believers. This was not a well-planned crime necessarily. It was a crime in which uh, the perfect elements came together to allow someone to get away with it. You had a city that was, that was corrupt. You had a police department that may have been involved. And you had the perfect scapegoat in Al Capone. And that allowed the man who, who really carried out this crime in the garage that day to walk away and to go forever unidentified. The scenario of three-fingered Jack White setting up the crime doesn't necessarily leave out Al Capone. I would say at the end of the day it was Al Capone that had it done. But I think that the reason 
was the policeman's son. I think that he was doing something for them. He assisted them. He brought the cops in, and I think that he okayed it. Fantastic motive. You murder a cop's son, this is what happens. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. Innocent people are gonna die. You kill a cop's son. So who was responsible for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre? I love my father. My father never told me a lie ever, not ever. And what he told me, I believe to be the truth. And the truth was just as plain as I said earlier. Who's the bad guy? Who's wearing the white hat? Who's wearing the black hat? You know, and in this particular instance, I believe in my heart that the bad guy that day were the police. I feel the same as Tommy, uh, and it came right from my father, too. And he, that's the story that I got, too, that it was the real police. And and you grew up in Chicago. Grew up in Chicago land, and so it's that's the way we always heard it. That's what we always thought was, was the real story. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I absolutely believe it was the police because I think it's the only thing that makes any logical sense. It was as simple as what it looked like. But I do think that the, the, the killing of the policeman's son, I, I absolutely am, am, am uh, convinced now. That was the reason. That that was the reason. To outsiders, a mobster's death is viewed with little emotion and a lot of curiosity. But mob families mourn the loss very differently. My mind goes right to, these are, this is a guy with a family, and you know, there, there's kids, and there's, that's where my mind goes. But the reality of the situation is that that could have been my dad laying on the floor, too. Johnny and Tommy Fratto's father, Lou, died of cancer in 1967, the same year the Massacre movie came out, the same year he was indicted for fraud and murder. He was one of those guys that really was a family guy. He really loved his family. And it's so hard for us, it was hard for us to figure out what's going on. Right. Because you read one thing and you see one thing, then he come home and try to explain to us really what's happening, you know? I saw my dad, I saw the angst he was going through, I know he was sick, and he's trying to explain to his children, this is wrong, I, I did nothing here. The relentless chase from law enforcement is a part of every mobster's life. Those who survived the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and its investigation did not have happy endings. Jack Machine Gun McGurn fell on hard times after the massacre. His blonde alibi wife left him. On the eve of Valentine's Day, 1936, he was shot to death. No! no! The killers left a note that read, you've lost your job, you've lost your dough, your jewels and handsome houses, but things could be worse, you know. At least you have your trousers. Fred Killer Burke received a life sentence for his murder of the Michigan police officer. Burke died of a massive heart attack in prison. Al Capone battled syphilis and dementia in and out of prison. His doctor stated he had the mental capacity of a child. He died of a stroke at age 48. Bugs Moran outlived them all, but died of lung cancer at age 65. Within 30 years of the massacre, all major players and suspects were dead. That didn't stop anybody from trying to figure it out, and it's not stopping anybody now. Everyone loves a good story about gangsters, especially when you can't tell the good guys from the bad guys. You know, I've spent a lot of years taking my dad and turning that image around and letting people see inside the, the man that, uh, uh, you know, was a real man, a genuine man's man. I think that uh, we've demonstrated that we are businessmen. I think we've demonstrated that we are good people moral people, and I think that's what, that's really how we want people to see us. Uh -huh.